Let's bow our hearts for a word of prayer. Father, we praise you for who you are. We thank you that you've given us this opportunity to meet in peace without persecution or in interference. We thank you, Father, for your word. We pray, Father, that your spirit would open your word to our lives and open our hearts to your word, that in all these things we might see more clearly just what it is you would have of us in the days ahead as we commit ourselves without any reservation into your hands in the name of Yeshua, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, we're studying the book of Revelation, and we're specifically in those two chapters that I regard as the most important in the entire book, chapters 2 and 3, which include seven letters to seven churches. And for reasons that I think will become very clear to us as we get into this, this is the most practical and the most essential part of the entire book to each of us. And we're going to tonight be exploring the letter to the Church of Smyrna. But just by a quick perspective and get a warm-up here, understand the book is singular, revelation. I read a biblical commentary just today in which the commentator said revelations, plural. I'm sure it was a typo, but that's revealing. No, it's, it, the word uh, apocalypsis means the unveiling. It's singular. It's the unveiling of Jesus Christ. It's the consummation of all things. It's the only book in the Bible that has the audacity to say, read me, I'm special. No other book of the Bible singles itself out above all the others as a, a book of special blessing. Revelation does do that. So we're going to claim that blessing tonight. And one of the reasons it's such a blessing, in the 404 verses that make up the book, there are over 800 allusions from the Old Testament alone. So if it sounds strange to our ears, it's because we're not as familiar as we should be to what we call the Old Testament, or what the Jews call the Tanakh. And of course, it's exciting because it represents the climax of God's plan of redemption for you and me and for the uh, earth and much more. To whom is it given? The revelation of Jesus Christ, it opens, which God gave unto him. Unto whom? Unto Jesus Christ. That shocks a lot of people to realize that. Everybody reads that and they don't stop to realize what it says. And why did he give it to him? To show unto his servants things which must suddenly come to pass. It's translated shortly. It really means when it starts, it'll be very quick. In fact, it's the same. It's the Greek word from which we get the word for tachometer. And he sent and signified it, rendered it into signs by, uh, by his uh, angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ, and of all the things that he saw. We're going to see a record that John the Apostle penned from things he experienced. He saw them firsthand. He heard them with his ears. And in, in a very, very exciting manner. So, okay. And this is, the third verse is one of several places in the book where this is expressed. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. And then it continues, that just like a, a, a memo or a letter, the whole thing is a letter to all the seven churches. John to the seven churches which are in Asia, that's the Roman province of Asia. Grace be unto you and peace from him who which, which is, which was, and which is to come. And from the seven spirits which are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness, the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. And it goes on. It's interesting, we have a trinity alluded to here, I believe. Unto him which is, which was, and which is to come, I regard, I view that as the Father. The seven spirits is the seven full spirits as detailed in Isaiah 11. And from Jesus Christ, of course. And then we have a number of appellations on his name, who is the faithful witness, the first begotten of the dead. And that first begotten of the dead phrase is going to be used as an identity in the letter we're studying tonight. In fact, each letter of the seven letters we're going to explore, Jesus selects a title of himself from chapter 1. It's always relevant to the key theme of each letter. It's a clue, in effect, to what the letter's all about. And the prince of the kings of the earth, and the him that loved us, washes from our sins in his own blood. So we have the outline of chapter 1 uh, that we looked at in our earlier meetings. 
which had an introduction, then the salutation, and the occasion of the book, then the vision of the risen Christ, a, a detailed physical description of Christ in heaven. But then we get to verse 19. That's why I wanted to focus on this, because this gives us the outline of the entire book and the outline that will uh, organize our study for us. The outline of the book and then the preparation for the last two verses of the chapter 1 are there. Now the outline is, write the, the things which thou hast seen. John is instructed to write three packages, so to speak. Write the things which thou hast seen, the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter, metatauta. And we have the partitioning, if you will, of the book into three parts. The past, present, and future, so to speak. What was the things thou hast seen? That's the vision of Christ that occurred in chapter 1. When you get to this verse, chapter 1 is essentially behind you. That's what thou hast seen, John. Then the things which are, and that'll turn out to be seven letters to seven churches that are in existence at the time John is writing. And from what happens after that is future and is the bulk of the book. Write the things which shall be metatauta, is the Greek phrase, translated here, hereafter. And chapter 4, verse 1, starts out with that same Greek phrase, metatauta. And so those are the three partitions. And the reason we focus so much on chapters 2 and 3, because those two chapters are the ones that impact you and I directly. You'll see why we have the view we have from chapter 4 on. We believe we'll be watching that from the mezzanine. So the part that affects us is, is chapters 2 and 3. The book of Acts covers about 30 years of church history. The book of Revelation covers the following 1900. And you'll see why as we go into it. And uh, now, so we're really focusing in this area, and we've decided, we've elected to actually spend a full session on each of the seven churches, and I'll try to show you why. Chapter 1 closes with the final verse. It says, The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden uh, lampstands. These were introduced earlier in the chapter, but I want you to notice Jesus himself explains what those symbols or signs means. It's astonishing to realize how many of the signs in Revelation are explained by the book itself. Not all of them, but they're all explained somewhere else in the Bible. One of the great treasure hunts that make up the uh, study of Revelation is to study it with a concordance, and every time you find some expression in there that you don't understand, track down that word elsewhere in the Bible, and to properly understand the book of Revelation, it'll take you into virtually every book of the Bible, Old and New Testament. But in any case, here Jesus explains the stars and the lampstands. He says, the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And the seven lampstands which thou sawest are the seven churches. And we're going to see those lampstands. They're on the earth in chapters 2 and 3, but they're going to be in heaven in chapter 4. Now the seven churches... The first question that will, and this will haunt us through the, the next uh, five sessions as well, why were these seven churches picked? There were more than seven churches in the, in the pro-counselor Asia, the, the area that we would think of as Turkey. There's certainly over a hundred churches uh, in the New Testament period. Why these seven? Why did the Holy Spirit pick these seven? And there's another phrase that occurs in each letter. Every letter uses a different title of Christ. It obviously, it's a different church. And the report card of that, which is basically what they are, of that church is different for each one. But there's one phrase that closes each letter. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. That's sort of a code phrase. It's sort of a closing phrase. And it gives us a clue as to what these are all, all about. There are at least four levels of understanding or application, of these letters. The first is local. These were real churches. We'll talk about that. They were real places with real churches that had real problems that these letters do address. But strangely, the letters go far beyond just that application. It turns out, the Holy Spirit says, He that hath any let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, plural. Every one of these letters apply to every church on the planet Earth. To different, in, in different degrees. And there's a central theme which each of the seven letters, and you need to understand the central theme of each letter, what was right, what was wrong, and what the remedies were required. Because there are parts of that that affect every one of the, ch the churches on the planet Earth. So it's, it's, each letter is admonitory in a collective sense, in a broad sense. 
But all, the Spirit also says, he that hath an ear. How many of you have earlobes? Can I see a show of hands? Okay, it's about 90%. Good, okay. Uh, <laughs> then if you have an ear, you are to listen to this, and that means there is a personal application. The Holy Spirit intended this letter tonight to apply to each one of us to some degree. Now that, so far, so good, no problem. There's a fourth letter that creates some controversy. They have a prophetic implication. And this is not some kind of fringe conjecture. Some people might regard it that way. But I'll just show you why so many scholars, ourselves included, uh, feel they are prophetic by making just one simple observation. If these letters were in any other order, this would not be true. But in the order they're in, and with the emphasis that they have, they lay out a history of the church from the apostolic period to the present day. And you have to see that for, you'll either see that or you don't. It's up to you. But we'll show you why we have that view. Now, as we get into this, it's be, it'll be instructive for us to be conscious of seven elements that make up the letter. There, it, there's the name of the church. And the name of the church will have an impact on what it's really all about. That's quite surprising when you think about it. And uh, Jesus, in addressing that church, selects a title of himself that fits the situation. And each title is different. There are seven different titles of Christ introduced in chapter 1 and seven different titles of Christ that are used in the seven letters. Then there's a report card. There's some good news. The commendation. You did this really well. I know your works and this, this, this is really great. You feel pretty good. Then you get to the fourth element, which is an expression of concern. We're going to say, nevertheless, I have this problem. I have this concern over you. You're not doing quite what you should be over here. Whatever. So it's a report card. Once he gets through that, then there's an exhortation. Here's the remedy. Here's what I want you to focus on. Not everything. Here's the specific things you need to focus on in your situation. And then there's a promise included for the overcomer. Each letter includes a little phrase near the end that says, uh, for the one that the overcometh, I will do this, that. Now, there's a special little reward for the one that overcomes. And then there's this strange closing phrase. He that hath an ear... Hear what the Spirit says at seven churches. Now you'll see why there are seven elements here, because what you're going to discover when you do all seven churches, there's a couple of churches that have no commendation. There's a couple of churches that have no concern expressed. And what's more important to recognize is that every church will be surprised. Every church will learn something they didn't know. The ones that thought they were doing great are not doing so great. The ones that thought they were doing terribly are doing much better than they thought. And that's sobering, because we need to realize that our assessment of ourselves, our own church and ourselves, is probably at some variance from the way the Lord sees us. And that's part of what we want to gain by understanding these letters. It's what's, what is his perspective? What's his agenda? What's his business plan, so to speak? So there's report cards. Okay, there's, we'll take the churches, all seven, not just the first three, but the name, the title, common. And what we'll do is we'll fill these in, and you'll discover some interesting things as we go. Now, Ephesus last time, the word Ephesus meant the desired one. They were very, very good on doctrine, but uh, uh, they had lost their first love. They were, God desires devotion, not just doctrine, and that was their shortcoming and, and so forth. And we went through all of that last time, except we noticed something when we did this, that the promise to the overcomer was the last thing in the letter. It was after the closing phrase, he that hath an ear, and so forth. It's almost as if the promise to the overcomer was a postscript. Now, with just this one letter, that we, I'm not going to jump to any great conclusions. I just want to call your attention to the value of being very precise when you study. And we're going to discover that the first three are characterized this way. The last four are different. We're going to discover there's several ways. The first three letters are distinctive from the last four, and we'll do that as we go. And we also determined that the, we suggested the possibility, at least, that Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea are each descriptive of a successive phase of church history, it seems. At least that's the conjecture. And of course, Ephesus would be descriptive of the apostolic church, the early church, the first century or so, very jealous for doctrine. That's where we had all the councils and putting, to, putting down these various heresies that surfaced. They're very diligent on that, but they lost their first love. They lost their, 
their, their, the love for the king. They were too busy on the business of the king to have time for the king. That was, that's the quick snapshot of Ephesus. But we're tonight going to explore the second letter. The letter to Smyrna. And unto the angel in the church, it's Smyrna, right? By the way, the word Smyrna comes from Smyrios, which is a Greek word that has a Hebrew root, which is mur, which means death. It actually is a word that means myrrh, myrrh. And myrrh is a, made from a, a, a gum of certain trees or shrubs in Arabia or Ethiopia, and it's highly valued for a number of reasons. It's used in perfume. It's also used in holy anointing oil for priests, and it's used in the purification of women in Esther 2 and so forth. But the primary use of, of myrrh was for embalming and for uh, suffering, a pain reliever. Myrrh gives off its characteristic scent by being crushed. So the very term here is going to turn out to be very descriptive of the church at Smyrna. Now, you recall when, the, when we, at Christmas we usually celebrate the wise men, bringing the three, they're actually not wise men, they're the magi, but in any case, they bring the three gifts to the child. They bring what? What were the three gifts, anyone? Gold, frankincense, Go, gold, frankincense and myrrh, exactly. Gold speaks of royalty. Frankincense is a um, incense for uh, priesthood, speaking to his deity and priesthood. And myrrh, of course, speaks of his suffering and death. So the three, it's prophet, priest, and king. The prophet in the sense of the, the frankincense, or I should say uh, uh, prophet in the sense of gold, well, prophet, priest, and king, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. The, the uh, uh, king being gold, the prophet being a frankincense, and the or prophet, priest, and, priest being frankincense, and prophet in the sense of prophesying his death. Now, the reason that's interesting is, and of course, the body of Jesus was embalmed in myrrh by Nick, Joseph and Nicodemus in John 19. But it's interesting to look ahead in the millennium because we find in Isaiah 60, it's going to, it mentions that he is going to be given gifts when in the millennium of gold and frankincense, but no myrrh. Why no myrrh? Because his death is behind him. It's once and for all. And uh, it, so and there are, we're, there are obviously different levels of application. We'll focus initially, of course, on the local. Lo, the, Smyrna was an actual place. It's about 42 miles north of Ephesus. It had a double harbor had a narrow entrance to the second part with a chain that could be blocking it. This has since been silted in, but that's the way it was originally. Today, this city is a thriving city in Turkey. It's known as Izmir, which is a Turkish rendering in the sense of Smyrna. And it's the third largest city in Turkey. It's got about 300,000 population. It's a very beautiful, very bustling city. In the New Testament period, it probably had a population of about 100,000, which was a very large city in those days. It ex exports tobacco, grapes, figs, cotton, olives, and olive oil. A lot of shipping. It's got a great harbor. In fact, if you look at a map, that's where Patmos is. That's where the, John is writing this. We were at Ephesus last time, and that uh, had a harbor that was getting uh, filled with erosion because the Romans took down all the trees, and that caused erosion. That eventually lost the harbor. But Smyrna is about 42 miles to the north. It has an excellent, almost double harbor, and as such, it, is on a, it becomes a major trading port that connects uh, Gr Greece and the rest of it to, uh, to, the, uh, to the east. And uh, if you look at a, a regular contemporary map, you can see Izmir there, uh, just north of Ephesus, and uh, you get it, it's roughly, it makes it, if you, you can almost see a triangle between Athens, Izmir, and Patmos to get a rough feeling for the geography there. Very, very key location. In fact, it's always been. It's at the entrance of a very fertile valley and a, a very well-sheltered gulf, very sheltered harbor. So it was very, its strategic placement caused it to rival other cities, Sardis and others, as the, as the connection between Asia and uh, Europe. And so it was very prosperous from the beginning. Strabo uh, described it as the most beautiful city in the world. And even today, the bustling Izmir has been termed the Paris of the Levant. And so... Uh, it was devastated many years ago. It, uh, it had a history of about 2,500 years before it was devastated by uh, uh, the Lydians and so forth. But anyway, if we get to about the 4th century, Alexander the Great orders one of his generals, Lysimachus, 
to build a strong, well-planned city, the most beautiful city in that region. And uh, it became known as the Flower of Iona. So it, it was singled out for excellence very early. And it, it prospered. In addition to that patronage from Alexander, it also became one of the greatest uh, cities of the known world. When you get to about 27 B.C., it comes under the control of the Romans because it, it was a very faithful ally to Rome in the Syrian and Mithraic wars, and so um, they, they, they played the chips right, and they were on the winning side. So they uh, enjoyed great material prosperity for the next several centuries. During the reign of Tiberius, there was a contest, and they won it to be the, uh, the uh, 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 make one of the first major um, uh, statues for Tiberius, and uh, but it also it has been hit pretty hard by earthquakes. Several back then in the reign of Tiberius, between 178 and 180, it practically uh, was reduced to uh, to ruins, but rebuilt. By the time you get to Marcus Aurelius, uh, it was he restored it. In fact, parts of his agora are still standing there. You can when you visit, you can see them there. And about 370, another earthquake demolished the city. But again, they always rebuild. It's it's so prosperous and it's such a critical uh, location that uh, there's a lot of pressure to always you know, rebuild. But it obviously has been a major pagan center. At the foot of the mountain, there's a huge temple for Zeus, which is considered in, in that pantheon uh, the father of the gods and so forth. But also along the Golden Street, as it's called, from the port all the way up to that mountain, there's just a, a row of shrines. Apollo to Apollo the sun god, to Aphrodite, the goddess of love and so forth, Escalapius, the god of medicine. We're going to talk more about him next time because he's very prominent in Pergamus. We'll talk about some of the interesting things that lie behind that whole tale. Sibylle is the primary goddess for, the, for, the, for uh, Smyrna. At the Agora itself, that's the commercial and political center, there were statues of Poseidon, the sea god, and Demeter, the, the goddess of corn. But in any case, the primary deity they worshipped was Sibylle, and uh, I won't get into a lot of this, except her worship was very wild and unrestrained. She's considered the giver of wealth, and she's always in th depicted enthroned with a very unusual crown, a crown of battlements and towers. And I mention this primarily because there are some speculation by some scholars that in Daniel chapter 11, it, 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 there may be an allusion to this because of, speaking of, as the goddess of fortress, and your King James is the god of forces, but in the the rendering is it's actually female. The goddess of fortresses is alluded there, and some people associated with this particular idol. But more to the point of our interest, uh, Smyrna was also one of the early places to sponsor Caesar worship. It readily accepted Caesar worship. In, in 196 B.C., so this is a couple of centuries before the period that we're going to be watching in John's period, the uh, Smyrnians were erected a temple to Dea Roma, the goddess of Rome. And, 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 and because of that, they won the contest, so to speak, to build uh, this uh, temple to Tiberius in 26 A.D. You realize that the, the, uh, the, uh, the emperor, the, it, uh, it became a, uh, went from republic to an empire in about 30. The worship of the emperor was compulsory. Now, for most people, this was a token gesture. Each year, a Roman citizen had to burn a pinch of incense on the altar and acknowledge publicly that Caesar was supreme lord. Now, this was simply an action they took to be primarily, it's primarily a political one, because every individual in the empire could worship whatever gods they wanted to, because they had all kinds of tribes and cultures that they had conquered. But what they wanted to do is get everyone to acknowledge that Caesar's number one. That was their way of, what they're really, that was their way of uh, uh, having them express a commitment to Caesar above all others. And so uh, uh, it was just a way of unifying the, uh, and integrating the many elements of the empire. But, and, and, and if you did that, you, you go up there and you put a pinch of whatever it is into the fire, you received a formal document that you had done so each year. And that was a very important certificate politically. Now, this was, unfortunately, a very vital test for a Christian. Because, and there were many Christians that went ahead and did that just to avoid trouble. But Christians who were serious about Jesus Christ had a problem. They refused to go and put this pinch of incense in the fire, and that caused them to be burned at the stake, in effect, willingly. 
Because all they had to do to avoid being burned at the stake is put a pinch of stuff in the fire. But not in good conscience, because if Jesus Christ is Lord, Caesar isn't. And so those that refused were made an example of, either by being burned at the stake or fed to the lions or whatever. So anyway, let's take a look at the letter Jesus writes to the church of Smyrna. Under the angel of the church of Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. Now this is the title of, that Jesus chose. Now interesting title. First and the last, he which was dead and is alive. These are the elements of the identity of Christ to this church. And it's interesting, you're going to see that concept of death all through this, because they were facing martyrdom every day. We, last time, we, when we looked through chapter 1, we noted that this expression, first and the last, occurs how many times in the Bible? Seven. Seven. Good guess. <laughs> and uh, and it's, uh, what's very revealing is in two of the places, he not only says he's the first and the last, but he was dead and is alive. And uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a blow to the Jehovah's Witnesses, because they love to talk about Jehovah God and so forth, and you can get them to acknowledge in each of these references that the first and the last is, of course, what they call Jehovah God. But Revelation 1.17 and Revelation 2.18 has got an embarrassing phrase tucked in there. I'm the first and the last who was dead and am alive. That's a little hard to deny that that's speaking very specifically of none other than Jesus Christ. But um, then he gets to the report card. I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them that say they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. Ooh. Now this is the commendation. This is the good news, Smyrnians. Jesus says, I know thy works. We need to notice that almost every letter says, opens that way. The commendation is, I know thy works. Jesus knows what you've accomplished. He knows what, what really motivated it, whether it was public approbation or whether it was really for him. But in any case, I know thy works and, their tri and your tribulation and your poverty. Now, by the way, this term tribulation, don't confuse tribulation with the great tribulation. Tribulation here is used in the sense of persecution. We're going to be dealing with the great, a specific period of tribulation that Jesus himself labels as the great tribulation. But this is speaking in effect of, of just persecution and poverty, but then he inserts a little editorial comment, but thou art rich. They thought they were poor, but Jesus is telling them, hey, you're better off than you think you are. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. Let's talk just a little bit about tribulation. There's several different words. The word that's used here is thalipsis, which is a pressing together, crushing under pressure. It's a metaphor for oppression, affliction, tribulation, distress, or straits. Um, anyone here not in tribulation? Okay. That was a trap. You'll see why in a little bit. But I want to emphasize right up early, we're not talking about the great tribulation. That's going to become clear as we go downstream. We, every one of us, are going to have tribulation, trouble, persecution. Why? Because Jesus promises it in John 16, 33, 2 Tim, Timothy 3, 12, and elsewhere. He also speaks of our poverty. We're poverty but rich, according to his... This is going to be in contrast, vivid contrast, to the church at Laodicea at the end, which thinks they're rich but are actually poor. The church of Smyrna thought they were poor but were much richer than they thought. The church at Laodicea with its fancy cathedrals or whatever, thinks they're rich, but are actually poor. And we're going to we'll indulge in that contrast later as we go. There are two words for poverty in the Greek. Penia, which means having nothing that's superfluous. I'm mean, having nothing uh, superfluous. That's, you know, you've got your minimum necessities. And uh, tachia, which is uh, the one that word that's used here. It's a state of one that has nothing at all. It implies absolute beggary. We have to beg for everything. You've got Zippo, nothing, less than nothing. You've got zero with the rim rubbed out, okay? <laughs> Jesus says, I know you're suffering. That's how comforting that is. Now, what's interesting about their poverty, it could have been ameliorated with a pinch of incense in a fire offered to Caesar. It would all go away, no problem. And there were some that would argue, well, I'm secretly a Christian. I'm just not going to, I'm just, I'm not going to avoid some trouble. And, and, uh, that was sort of the parallel, the parallel idea in the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews is written to the Hebrew Christian while the, well, the temple was still standing. And many of them were getting oppressed by their Jewish friends because they were Christians. Some of them were considering the idea of going along with that 
and getting saved at the last minute. And that was what, what the writer of Hebrews points out, that's not an option. Then we get into this strange thing. Who are these that say they are Jews and are not? What on earth could they, they, the blasphemy uh, that say they are Jews and are not? But Jesus designates them as the synagogue of Satan. Who is this referring to? Now, John, the writer, knows a lot about the blasphemy of Jews. If you read John chapter 8, it's one of the most intense uh, exchanges between Christ and the Pharisees. They call him illegitimate. They, make a, they, they crashed, cast an aspersion to his birth, that Mary was, was uh, unmarried when he was, you know, uh, gotten pregnant. And he says, I'll tell you something about your fathers. You're, you're the father of the devil. And there's a, there's a, there's real, you, you, when you read John 8, you want to really understand the sparks that are flying. But he understands the blasphemy of Jews. Some of the scholars view this um, allusion to those that were legalistic, the legalists, the Ju Judaizers. And this is the leaven that the epistle of the Galatians hits head on. And, uh, you know, remember in Acts 15, there was the demand that the Gentile converts had to get circumcised. Circumcision was a symbol of, a, of an allegiance to the uh, covenant with Abraham. Circumcision of the children was a demonstration that the parents were committed to the... To the uh, uh, covenant of Abraham. Now, in today's world, it doesn't mean as much because it's often done just for medical reasons, but in the, you know, classically, the, the circumcision was an indication of the parents being committed to Abraham. Well, the idea was that when a Gentile became a Christian, they were obviously uh, generally un uncircumcised, there was, a, that, there was a big issue, and that's what led to the council in Acts 15, in which it was the conclusion was that uh, uh, they don't have to become Jews to become Christians, okay? And uh, even Peter is rebuked by Paul in these issues. In Galatians 2 and 3, it's mentioned. Where Paul rebukes Peter, and Peter later admits he was wrong. He agrees in a second letter. About Paul, although he sort of mumbles, he says, some things are hard to understand. <laughs> but they had their issues on here. And uh, now you need to understand, if you're going to understand the, the history here, the early persecution of Christians was brought about by the Jews, not the Romans. That came later. The early, that's why um, Luke, as he drafts what I believe are the do trial documents for Paul's appeal to Rome, in both Luke 1 and Luke 2, the book of Acts, uh, we find the, that, uh, that one of the emphasis that's always there is that the, the, the troubles were always fanned by the local Jewish community that regarded the Christian sect as a heretical sect, of course. And so that happened in Antioch in Acts 13, in Iconium in Acts 14, in Lystra in Acts 14, in Thessalonica in Acts 17, and so forth. And just to mention a few of them. It's interesting that Polycarp was trained at the feet of Paul. Paul trained Polycarp, and Paul probably appointed Polycarp as the bishop of Smyrna. Okay? So he's a, one of the early church fathers. In 166 A.D., now understand Paul is, I mean, excuse me, John is writing, did I say Paul before, excuse me? John was the guy that trained Polycarp. I may have slipped my tongue, I may have said it wrong. John trained Polycarp. John's the one that appointed uh, Polycarp to the, as the bishop of Smyrna. And John is writing the, uh, this letter uh, in about 95 A.D., under, under, the, uh, under Domitian, right? About 166 A.D., so a good, you know, a good... Polycarp by now is probably 100 years old, maybe over 100 years old. And he is, he refused to recant, as he was asked to. And his quote, when they put, they're tying him to the stake, to burn him at the stake, he said, Eighty and six years have I served him, Jesus Christ. And he never did me wrong. How can I now blaspheme my king who has loved me so? Bring on the flames. So, <clears throat> so this old man was burned at the stake on a Sabbath day by the Jews, as well as uh, he had, they encouraged the Jews. They, they, were, they, were, they were, you know, part of the cheering section here as they burned Polycarp, the Bishop of Smyrna, at the stake. You know, we speak of the, remember the uh, parables of the various soils? and the t sowing of the tares. There are four tares that were sown in the early church. Legalism was one of them. Legalism denies Christ's completed work. Gnosticism is a denial of Christ's humanity. 
and Caesar worship, the denial of Christ's lordship. These three uh, cares or false doctrines are, uh, were the primary adverse thrusts against the early church. Legalism, denying Christ's completed work, Gnosticism, denial of Christ's humanity, and Caesar worship, denial of Christ's lordship. Okay, let's get to the exhortation then. Jesus goes on, Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, and that ye may be tried. And ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Pretty straightforward exhortation. Fear none of those things. It's interesting that one of the condemnations we'll see in the lake of fire, but it, when it lists the various people who can be thrown in the fire, the first one listed are the fearful. It's hard to realize that fearfulness is the opposite of faith. Fear none of these things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, who's going to cast you into prison? The devil. He's behind all of this. That ye may be tried. And ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I'll give thee the crown of life. See, they're fearful of death. Jesus will give them the crown of life. Now, this term ten days has a couple of different understandings by various authors. The term ten days is held by some scholars as to be an, a Hebrew idiom for a short period of time. We find it used that way in Genesis 24, verse 55, Job 19.3, Dan 1.12. It's used as a figure of speech, if you will. And that may be what it means, but I'm going to show you something, other, another view that might be more defendable. By the way, the cr word crown here is a Stephanos, not a diadem. So the Stephanos here is the, is, is the kind of thing you reward a victor, if you will. And uh, so, ten days. It's interesting that there were ten, if you study the persecutions by Rome, we obviously had Nero, was, was one of the bad guys. He, he's the guy that had Paul beheaded, and he's the one that crucified Peter upside down. Then we get to Domitian. That's the guy that exiled John to Patmos, and that's, in other words, the contemporary guy here. Um, and... Uh, he is followed by Trajan when, Tra when Trimission dies and when John is released from Patmos to go back to Ephesus, where he retires, in effect. But Trajan is the guy that had Ignatius burned at the stake, and he's followed by Marcus Aurelius. This brings you into the period that was celebrated in the movie The Gladiator, essentially, if you recall. Marcus Aurelius is the guy that it was in his reign that Polycarp gets burned at the stake. Then we have uh, Septimus Severus, who is the uh, one that killed Irenaeus. And then we get to uh, Maximus, and uh, he killed Ursala and Hippolytus, and uh, Decius, and uh, Valerian, and then Aurelian, and then finally Diocletian. Diocletian is, is the tenth of this gang. Notice they're not necessarily contiguous. These are the particular emperors under which there was specific, directed persecution against the church. And the worst of the bunch was Diocletian, the last guy on the list. And a total of 250 years, some scholars suspect the 10 days or 10 periods are here, here you know, profiled. And so either way. Roman persecution uh, occurs, there, there was famine and pestilence on Rome. Diseases were brought back from the Parthian Wars. The, they, the diseases devastated Rome. And also the Tiber overflowed and put the grain storehouses underwater. All this led to famine and persecution at various times. And what they did, the convenient scapegoats, was this illegal underground religious movement called Christians. They were a convenient sca a scapegoat. And so it was convenient for the politicians to somehow pin the blame for these disasters on the Christians. So Christianity became a crime. Five million believers died for Christ during this period, according to Fox's Book of Martyrs. Sound terrible? The 20th century murdered more Christians than all the other centuries put together. So while this is bloody and while this is dark, it doesn't compare to today. To today. Stalin himself murdered somewhere between 10 and 20 million, somewhere between 30 and 40 million of his own people, of which the estimates are 50% of them were Christians. And you could go on and on. But so, in addition, of course, to the Jewish issue that we all are familiar with. 
There are crowns promised. We saw the crown of life promised in this one. I thought it would be a good time to point out there's five that are specifically promised in the Scripture. Crown of life for those who have suffered for his sake, and both here and in James um, James chapter 1. The crown of righteousness is promised in 2 Timothy 4 for those who love his appearance. Crown of glory for those who fed the flock. Crown incorruptible for those who press on steadfastly. The crown of rejoicing for those who win souls. So how many crowns are there going to be given out? Trick question. <laughs> Probably many, many, many different kinds. If I was going to pick a guess, I wouldn't pick the five that are listed. I'd guess seven, but I suspect there's more than that too. These are just happen to be the ones that are alluded to specifically in the Scripture. Okay, we went through the exhortation. And after the exhortation, we have this phrase, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And then we have this promise to the overcomer. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. And uh, the first, first thing I want you to notice is the structure. You notice that the promise to the overcomer, just like the previous letter, is like a PS. It's after the close of the letter. It's like an appendage. And uh, it speaks of the second death. Revelation, uh, we'll, we'll talk about that in chapter 20. We'll talk about it more there. Also, Jude talks about being twice dead. You see, if, you, you know, if you're uh, born once, you die twice. If you're born twice, you die once. That's the way to go. Right? Okay. Well, I said there are different applications. Let's talk, uh, how does this apply? That, fine, we've talked about how it applies to, to Smyrna. But how does it apply to you and I? Well, first of all, one way we need to apply this, and I'll show you, we're, we're, I'm going to give you an addenda at the end of this, will may surprise you, but don't confuse persecution with the Great Tribulation. And here's the key phrase. I didn't even put it on a slide. I want you to be paying attention here. Just because we believe we can prove to you that the church will not go through that period of time called the Great Tribulation, where do we in America... Get the arrogance to presume that we'll be exempted from what most of the body of Christ in most of the world for most of the last 1900 years have had to endure. It's called persecution. Don't confuse. A lot of people accuse pre-trib people of being escapists. No, hardly. Hardly. No, we, 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 we're not that naive. Most of the body, most of the world, most of 1900 years had to endure persecution. It is the opinion of many, and we join with those, that ultimately the body of Christ in America will have to go underground again, like it had to in the early years. But let's get back to this non-Jews. What on earth are the non-Jews? Is it possible, is it possible that these who say they are Jews and are not are those who claim that Israel forfeited her promises and it now falls upon the church? Is it possible that this illusion... This very strange illusion that we find here in this letter may be reflexive on the people who hold a view that's called replacement theology. That somehow, because Israel rejected her Messiah, that all those promises that God gave Israel now fall upon the church. That's taught in most churches in America, by the way. But it's blasphemy. It makes God a liar. Because Paul, in his definitive statement of Christian doctrine called the Book of Romans, hammers away for three chapters, chapters 9, 10, 11, that God is not finished with Israel. That, that's a heresy. The origin of the ch Israel and the church, the, the origin and the destiny for the church and Israel are different. Different origins, different destinies. We need to understand that. And this replacement theology is the root cause to anti-Semitism, and it was the root cause of the Holocaust in Europe, the silent pulpits in Europe. Okay, we've talked about the uh, monetary. What about to us personally? What does the Smyrna letter have to do with you and I? Well, for one thing, 2 Timothy 3.12. We've mentioned it before, but let's look at it. Yea, and all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Now, I won't ask you to put up your hands if you're not having persecution, because that implies you're not living godly in Christ. <laughs> so, people come up to me and say, Gee, Chuck, I'm, I, I'm not in a persecution. I've got good news for you. Just wait. <laughs> Okay, personally, we are promised persecution. It raises a question, why do Christians have trials? This is a throwback to our review of the book of Romans. And uh, you may recall I, I, picked, I had ten examples of why Christians have trials. I got most of these from Hal Lindsey's book, Combat Faith. Hal's book, on, uh, we, we put this in our Romans study. To glorify God, we find that in Daniel 3 and elsewhere. 
Another reason Christians have trials is to discipline for known sin. Not necessarily, but sometimes. And there's a number of passages that support that. Often we have trials to prevent us from falling into sin. 1 Peter 4 deals with that. To keep us from pride. That was Paul with his thorn in the flesh. Many of us suspect it was an eyesight problem, but nevertheless, whatever it was, it kept him from pride. My grace is sufficient for thee, uh, God told him three times. Sometimes we have trials to build our faith. That's what Nan's book's all about, the faith in the night seasons. To cause growth. That's the way we grow. It's like sandpaper. It takes off the rough, rough edges sometimes. To teach obedience and discipline. To equip us to comfort others. One reason you may be going through a dark valley is to equip you to minister to people in the future that are going to be that, in that kind of a valley. To prove the reality of Christ in us. To draw us into intimacy is the way Dan would express it. Another one is kind of a surprise te for testimony of the angels. Job 1.8 is an example of that. Ephesians 3, 8 and following. First Peter 1 deal with that dimension. So there are a lot of reasons. Thus, in any case, that leads us to James chapter 1. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect, that is complete and entire, wanting nothing. That's your key verse for the day personally. But there's another dimension to this. Jesus said, to ask, he asked the Smyrnans to demonstrate their ambassadorship by not putting that pinch of incense in the fire, not, not acknowledging Caesar as Lord. See, I think the third commandment has nothing to do with vocabulary. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. It's not about vocabulary. It's about ambassadorship. If you're going to be a, uh, an ambassador of the king, you better represent him accurately and fairly and reliably. And uh, so that's... Uh, it's interesting that... Uh, the name of God is always the name. The word name is always in the singular. You may say God has many names, yes, but he has one name. And you're representing God when you say uh, uh, you take the name of the Lord thy God, singular, name singular. Okay, that leaves prophetic. And in this case, uh, just Ephesus, we went through this before with Ephesus. We assumed that Ephesus was pretty much the apostolic church. That makes Smyrna the persecuted church. And after the apostolic period, we go through these centuries up until Constantine, where they are up until the, 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 you know, the, uh, the beginning of the 4th century, where um, uh, we have something even more disastrous than persecution take place, and we'll take that next time. So we've taken Ephesus, Smyrna, and, Pergam, or, or Ephesus and Smyrna, and Ephesus was last time. We went through there, and we, of course, noted that the promise the overcomer was uh, below the uh, end of the letter. Smyrna had uh, the same structure, but there's something you may not have caught. What were Christ's concerns in the letter to Smyrna? The answer is, there wasn't any. So we notice by omission that he didn't give them any negatives on the report card. That's going to be interesting to map as we go further in our study. But um, we're, I've left a little time at the end to put an addenda. This addenda, I think, is going to be some essential background as we go forward in the book of Revelation. And uh, I'd like to talk about one of the pivotal prophecy passages in the New Testament called the Olivet Discourse. It's recorded in Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21. And when you look at all three of those passages, they are so similar that virtually 99 out of 100 Bible scholars will assume that they're the same message recorded in three slightly different ways by three different hearers. I'm going to suggest to you to put that on the shelf for the moment, and let's examine those, because I think in, if you are precise in your understanding of the Scripture, if you really believe it's God-breathed, if you really believe in what we call a high view of inspiration, then if there are differences, those differences may prove to be very significant. So let's take a look at Matthew 24's rendering as the base rendering, because he took shorthand. We can assume it's a competent record. Let's go through it. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple. His disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said to them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, there shall not left, be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, 
Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and the end of the age? Now, we're not going to be able to resolve all the issues as we go. We're just going to hit a few highlights. But first of all, they came to him privately. And where? On the Mount of Olives. You with me so far? It may surprise you, no, that's not the Luke account. We'll, we'll come back to that in a little bit. Jesus answered said to them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Notice Christ's injunction here. See that you be not deceived. How do you, not be, how do you keep from being deceived? There's, that's a whole study that we're going to undertake separately, but it, it's, it's, it's our challenge. Let's move on here. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled. For these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. And all these are the beginning of sorrows. Notice that verse, that, that, that verse, nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There shall be famines, pestilence, earthquakes, and diverse places. You'll discover that those signs, that group of signs, are distinctive. They're in the Matthew account, they're in the Luke account, and they also constitute the first half, if you will, of Revelation 6. So we're going to talk about those in depth when we get to chapter 6, but just be aware of them as sort of a marker at this point. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations for my namesake. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another, and many false prophets shall arise and shall deceive many. Notice that first word in verse 9 of Matthew 24. Then. Matthew's talking about what happens after the beginning of sorrows. What happens after that group of sides. You with me so far? Okay. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold, and he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness to all nations, and then shall the end come. And then he has this key verse. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, let whosoever reads, let him understand. The abomination of desolation. This is a technical term that Jesus could use because for two centuries earlier, that had happened and every Jew knew it. Uh, Antiochus Epiphanes, he, he, tried, he made re reading the Torah a crime. He outlawed Judaism. He, he slaughtered a pig on the uh, uh, brazen altar in Jerusalem. If you know how they feel about pork and how they feel about that altar, you can imagine how that went over. He didn't stop there. He then erected an idol to Zeus in the Holy of Holies. And that tore it. That led to the Maccabean Revolt, where, though vastly outnumbered, they took on the Greek Empire, and they uh, uh, threw off the yoke of the Seleucid Empire. It took three years, and when they regained their control, they destroyed all the implements of the temple that had been de defiled by the Greeks. And they made new ones, and they rededicated the temple, and that's honored to this very day by what they call the Feast of Lights or Hanukkah. And Jesus himself observed it in John 10, verse 22. So we know what that is, but Jesus is using it prophetically. So that event that happened two centuries earlier, Jesus says, is going to happen again. He says, when you therefore shall see this happen. Spoken of by Daniel the prophet, Jesus here just saved you hours of boring library research. Did Daniel write the book of Daniel? Absolutely. Was he a prophet? Absolutely. How do I know? Jesus told me so. That ends the argument. I can give you lots of other proofs, but that's, that's all you need. And where is this abomination of desolation? It has to stand in the holy place. This is not just a desecration of the temple by burning it down. But the Romans did do that. No, this, is, this was a specific political move. Now, how many of you read that with me this evening? Well, on the screen. I see your hands? I did a dirty trick to you. You see, that's not just for pastors or theologians. That's for you. If you read it, you have a command from Jesus Christ to understand that. Now, we're not going to cover it all here, but you need to make a commitment to yourself to really understand what this verse... Because this is the pivotal verse of prophecy. Jesus himself points them to Daniel 9 as the key. And we'll, we, we, we're going to append two, two uh, sessions to our study... Our study notes will have them, the tapes that, you, that this will be on will have them with you on Daniel 70 weeks, because that's an essential piece of background. Anyway, when you see that abomination of desolation, Jesus says, Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains, let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house, neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes, but woe unto them that are with child, and that, to them that give suck in those days, and pray ye that your flight be not in winter, neither on the Sabbath day. Interesting thing, Sabbath day, who is he talking to? Jews. Matthew is writing to the Jews. Let's remember that because Luke's writing to the Gentiles. 
It'll be a little different. You'll see. For then shall be great tribulation. There's that term. He's, Jesus is quoting himself. He's quoting from Daniel 12. With virtually the same words occur. There, then shall be great tribulation such as not since the beginning of the world to this time nor ever shall be. So in other words, this is a distinctive period of time. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Don't assume that everybody that's saved is in the elect. That's another stumbling block for some. And then if any man should say unto you, Lo, here is Christ to there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets that shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they, would, they shall deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before. Wherefore they say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even to the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. He's talking about the second coming, not the rapture. Be careful. For wheresoever the carcass is, there shall the eagles be gathered together. What does that mean? I don't know. Neither have I found any scholar that has anything but guesses. That They at least admit they're guessing. They're not sure. They, they, they suspect that that was a... a uh, proverbial phrase at the time, but there's just conjectures as to, it has several different conjectures, but I'll leave that on the shelf for now. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, the stars shall fall from heaven, the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Has that happened yet? No. Absolutely not. There are people, prominent, prominent Christian leaders that claim this has already happened. Not this, they say, oh, that's just allegory. That's just allegory. And you, it reminds me of the old computer phrase in the computer industry. We say, if you torture the data long enough, it'll confess to anything. <laughs> then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall the tribes of the earth mourn, for they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from the one end of heaven to the other. Now learn the parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and put forth leaves, ye know that summer is nigh. So likewise ye, when ye shall see these things, all these things, know that it is near even at the doors. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. And the libraries are full of books that try to predict which generation are we talking about, how long is it? I won't go into that right now. We'll do that another time. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, not but my Father only. We're going to go look at Luke in detail, but we're not bothered with Mark, but I want to take one verse from Mark. And Mark's rendering is pretty parallel... Mark's rendering is Peter's, really. Mark was Peter's, his, his, his uh, secretary. But Mark does include something that Matthew doesn't. If you look at this verse in Mark 13, it says, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, neither the Son, but the Father only. This is a remarkable verse in the Scripture. Because at least at that moment, there was something the Father knew the Son did not. And that's just a, a provocative insight. Whatever he didn't know then, I'm sure he knows now. <laughs> okay. Neither the Son. Okay. And then Matthew goes on, But the days of Noah were, so shall the days of the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered in the ark, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Again, we're talking about the second coming, and again, we're taught you won't understand this passage unless you've done your homework in Genesis chapter 6 to understand what the days of Noah were, which again is another study. But anyway, Matthew goes on, Then shall be two in the field, one shall be taken, the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, one shall be taken, the other left. Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. But know this, that if the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. Who then is faithful and wise servant, who his Lord hath made ruler over his household, to give him meat in his due season? Behold, blessed is that servant, whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. For verily I say to you, that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. But, if that evil servant shall say in his heart, the Lord delayeth his coming. He shall begin to smite his fellow servants and drink and eat with the drunken. And the Lord of, the, of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him and in, in an hour when he is not aware of and shall cut him asunder and point him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Well, I don't know. There's a lot we could talk about this. All I'm going to do, make sure I'm, I'm not going to suggest the Lord's delaying at all. I think he can come any moment, okay? Let's take a quick look at Luke. And most people crunch these two together to assume they're the same presentation. Let's challenge that assumption and see what it reveals. This is Luke now. Luke 21. 
As some spake of the temple, how it was adorned with goodly stones and gifts, he said, for the, for these th As for these things which ye behold, the days will come in the which there shall not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. So it's obviously very similar to the Matthew thing, but it may not be exactly the same. Let's see here. And they ask him, saying, Master, but when shall these things be, and what sign shall there be when these things shall come to pass? And he said, Take heed that ye be not deceived. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and the time draweth near. Go ye not therefore after them. But when ye shall hear of wars and commotions, be not terrified, for these things must first come to pass, but the end is not by and by. Then said he unto them, Nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. See, we've got the same signs, the same group of signs are being alluded here in the Luke passage. And great earthquakes shall be in divers places, and famines and pestilence and fearful sights, and great signs shall be from heaven. Let's stop at verse 11 for a minute. Up till now, it's understandable why most people jump to the conclusion that these are just two recordings of the same meeting, right? Except I want you to notice verse 12. But before all these... Whoops. That's a strange phrase, because Matthew said, after these things, and what he talks about comes after those signs, what Luke's going to deal with here are things that happened before those signs. You see the difference? That difference turns out to be profoundly significant, because there, there are all kinds of very serious Bible scholars who, in effect, don't notice that before this. Before all these, they shall lay their hands on you and persecute you and deliver you up to the synagogues and into prisons, being brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake, and it shall turn to you for a testimony. Settle it therefore in your hearts, not to meditate before what you, sh what you shall answer. For I'll give you a mouth and a wisdom which all your adversaries shall not be able to gainsay nor resist. And ye shall be betrayed both by parents and by brethren and kinsfolks and friends, and some of you shall, shall they cause to be put to death. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake." But there shall not a hair of your head perish, in a permanent sense. That may be just a afterlife remark, or it may mean something else. I'll come back to you in a minute. In your patience possess ye your souls. And when ye shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains, and let them which are in the midst of it depart out. And let not them that are in the countries enter thereinto. For these be the days of vengeance that all things which are written may be fulfilled. So here Luke is telling them, before these signs, they're going to have trouble. And when they hear Jerusalem surrounded, get out of town when you can. Let me tell you something most people don't know. Titus Vespasian and his son Titus, Vespasian and his son Titus, were the main Roman leaders conquering the various cities in Israel about this time until Nero dies. When Nero dies, there's turbulence in Rome, and I won't go through all the politics. The Galba took over, they murdered him, and so forth. Vespasian goes to Rome as become the emperor of the entire empire, leaving his son, general, who then follows through and sets up the siege that causes Jerusalem to fall in 70 AD. The point is, I've, I've tracked this down. I've, 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 there are some scholars that point out they believe that no Christians got killed. Over a million people got killed in that siege. But no Christians. Why? Because Jesus warned them, when you see the cities getting surrounded, get out of town. And during this hesitation by the Romans, because of the turbulence associated with the Nero thing, they didn't close it up. And that gave those guys a chance to split and get into the hills, wherever. Follow me? And that's the, pr the premise by some scholars, is the Christians, if they followed Christ's advice, would not have been in the fall of Jerusalem. Interesting. Yeah, so, but uh, let's go on here. Woe unto them that are with child, and them that give suck in those days, for there shall be great distress in the land, and wrath upon this people. For they shall fall by the edge of the sword, and shall be led ca away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles, until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. And there shall be signs of the sun and the moon. This is now he's, he's looking ahead, of course, in the stars and upon the earth, the distress of nations, perplexity, the sea and waves roaring, men's hearts failing for fear and for looking after those things which are coming upon the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken, and then shall they see the Son of Man coming in cloud with power and great glory. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. And he spake to them in a parable, Behold the fig tree and all the trees. Notice not just a fig tree here, all trees. 
When they now shoot forth, ye know, you see and know of your own selves that summer is now nigh at hand. So likewise, ye, when you see these things come to pass, know ye that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. For I say unto this generation shall not pass away till all be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Take heed to yourselves, lest any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and cares of this life, so that they may come upon you unawares. For as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch ye therefore and pray always. Get this verse, interesting key verse. Watch ye therefore and pray always that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Wow, that's interesting. In the, in the daytime, now, now, you thought this was the Mount of Olives? No, look what Luke says. And in the daytime, he was teaching at the temple. At night, he went out and abode in the Mount of, that is called Mount of Olives. And all the people came early in the morning to hear him at the temple, or to hear him. Gee, I thought they were the same briefing. Apparently, they're similar, but not exactly the same. Very similar, but not the same. Again, we have this strange group of signs, but here's... Um, it's this strange thing that Luke says, and, but before all these, they shall lay hands upon you, etc., etc. Let's see if we can talk about... Luke says, before all these. Matthew says, then shall they. There's a big difference. And the, these verses bracket this group of signs. False Christs, wars, famines, earthquakes, right? Then and before, very different. Let's see if we can stand back from this now and draw some interesting observations. Luke and Matthew are taking a slightly different perspective. Luke's talking to Gentile and Matthew, the um, Jews. Both of them face this group of signs, wars, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, and so forth. You with me so far? Okay. Luke is focusing beforehand, Matthew after. There are two desolations of Jerusalem in view. Luke is focusing on the, the, the fall of Jerusalem in 70 A.D., which occurs prior to the wars uh, and, and pestilences and earthquakes. You with me? That's what he says. Matthew is looking at a different desolation, because he includes a milestone that Luke doesn't even mention. After the wars, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, Matthew says, these are the beginning of sorrows. But when ye shall see... In other words, after this, the abomination of desolation. Then let them which be in Judea flee, etc. You with me? So Matthew is focusing on a second desolation that is labeled by Jesus himself as the Great Tribulation. Yes, it does involve Jerusalem. That's the center of it. And uh, we, it, the, Jeremiah 30 verse 7 calls it the time of Jacob's trouble. So we have a big difference here. Why am I getting into this here? Because the seven letters, seven churches fit after the fall of Jerusalem, because that happened in 70 A.D., and John is writing in 95 A.D., but clearly when he's writing the wars and rumors of wars, what we call Revelation chapter 6 hasn't happened yet. You with me? Okay, we're together. Something very interesting. Luke doesn't even mention the Great Tribulation as such. He talks about its climax. He obviously has a, a total view involved, but he makes, he makes no mention of the abomination of desolation. He makes no mention of fleeing, of the, the fleeing to the mountains instruction are for those that are threatening captivity by the nations and so forth, right? See the difference? Very similar, but very different. Matthew is writing to the Jews, but the Jews aren't listening because Jesus, uh, riding that donkey, and he proclaimed judicial blindness on, on, in Israel that, John, that Paul talks about in Romans chapter 11, verse 25. Israel's blinded until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. So they're going to be blinded anyway. What Matthew, by the time you get to the abomination of desolation, they have woken up and be watching. The blindness is lifted. You follow me? Because the Gentiles will have come in. It's after the rapture. The rapture occurs at, between the seven letters and those signs. In a little, I should have left a little gap probably in the diagram there. It's interesting that Luke, while Matthew doesn't deal with the Jews in the fall of Jerusalem, Luke does. But Luke doesn't bother because his readers, I think, are in the mezzanine by the time you get to the, the last part of it. You with me? 
That's conjecture. I leave it with you to sort it out because it's going to, it's going to come up again and again. So that brings us to the close of our study tonight. For next time, I want you to once again read chapters 2 and 3. They're not that long. Read the whole chapters. And do an outline of the letter to Pergamos. It's going to be some, full of some surprises for you. And as background, if you have time, find out who Balaam was and who Balak was. You'll find that in Numbers 22 through about 25. And we'll talk about that because Jesus makes reference to them, and you won't understand what Jesus is talking about unless you have the background that he presumes you have. So that's our challenge for next time. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer. Let's bow our hearts. Oh, Father, we just thank you for your word. We thank you that it became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father. We thank you, Father, for your word. We thank you for this evening. And Father, we would pray that through your Holy Spirit that you would reignite in each of us a new passion for our King. Help us, Father, to repair the damage of Ephesus, that while we need to be sound on doctrine, we have to be ever more sound in our devotion. Help us, Father, to love you more. You've commanded us, the greatest commandment, to love you above all other things. And Father, we also thank you for the warnings in the letter of Smyrna. We do recognize that on the horizon there may be dark clouds, and yet those dark clouds will provide strength for the body. And Father, we do pray that you would just re reignite in each of us a hunger, an appetite for your word. Help us to really absorb and understand these seven letters that we might apply them as you would have us apply them to ourselves. We would, Father, that you just help us to see the path before us what you would have us do, how you would rearrange our priorities, that we might be much more effective stewards of the opportunities that lie ahead. As we commit ourselves right now before your throne without any reservation, we commit ourselves into your hands in the name of Yeshua. The first and the last, he was dead and is alive now. Whoever liveth to make intercession for us, we just thank you. In the name of Yeshua, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, amen.